Hello and welcome to episode two of season four of The Practice Odyssey. I'm Jen. And I'm Alex. This is our season of alternate instruments. I almost said universe, but it kind of is a universe, isn't it? A different alternate universe. No, but we are into alternate instruments and we're kicking off with that little, that little gem, the piccolo. Uh, everyone's favorite. Everyone's favorite. Actually, yeah, I did a concert and I uh, played a little bit of piccolo and one of the audience members came up to me at the end and said, do you reckon you could break glass with the sound of that instrument? It's like, glad you enjoyed the concert. <laughs> <laughs> to YouTube we go. Is this possible? <laughs> I was like, that's a question to take to Mythbusters. Let's go. Alex, how have you been? Are you still in Germany? Is it still snowing? I'm very excited about this thought. Oh, why, thanks for asking, Jen. Yes, I am still in Germany, in southern Germany. Mm -hmm. It is not snowing today. However, this weekend, it was a nice, balmy, negative four degrees Celsius during the day. And uh, yeah, it's good. And today, this weekend, it's supposed to be sunny and 13 degrees during the day. So I'm very Uh excited about that. Enough about me, Jen. Where are you? And how is the the weather? The weather of life. Ah, It's okay. It's the same as it always is. 33 degrees. Yep, doesn't really change. Although we are starting to gear up into hot season. So probably in a couple of weeks, it's going to be a balmy 35 degrees. Feels like 39 with humidity. Yes, yes. That is what I have to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it's actually interesting. I would like to know whether the listeners have any suggestions for playing in hot weather. Because often when I do perform, it's outside. And even though it's at night, it will often Mm -hmm. still be about 30 at least 33 degrees or 30 degrees and it will also be humid um so as you can imagine the sweats are a big thing and uh also particularly the chin like it's falling off the chin and I've got like one of these little uh you can buy those special sticky pads to put on the mouthpiece of your flute so that it grips a bit more to your face when you are warm Mm. however I have had a few concerts where I've actually sweated so much that the sticky pad came off the flute because it was so... <laughs> Sorry for the visual <laughs> listeners, but, I mean, oh it's, a, it's an issue here, much like cold hands in cold climates is a thing. If anyone's got any other suggestions, like I wear... A, I normally try and, like, wear a scarf so, you know, I can kind of dab away in between breaks, but even that, mm. I don't know. Does someone have, like, this go-to... What's your go-to, Alex, with really hot... Because you... you, uh, you used to play in another hot country like Texas and I guess the same thing would have happened there <laughs> in marching yeah. band in Texas what was the, what yes. was the hacks oh, well luckily in Texas when you're playing in hot climate normally you're on a at least when I did it the most the majority of the time it was during marching season and so therefore it doesn't matter if they can hear you or not because the trumpets and trombones are going to overblast <laughs> you no matter what and so uh, <laughs> however when I was living mm-hmm. in Australia with you we went on that trip and I heard from our friend Tony who plays in, mm. in the UK and she recommended medical tape the the Ooh. kind that's very um like not flaxy in texture but yeah like uh, material in texture yeah more material yeah. in texture yeah. and that you can just buy it you know at your local pharmacy so what I've been doing I usually just apply some of that onto my flute and then mm. reapply during the concert as much as necessary and since it's just you know it's very cheap to come by it's mm-hmm. like a euro for a whole roll of tape I can just uh, reapply that and then just uh, you know try to breathe consistently and so that I find also helpful in between but yes it is an issue wonderful Ooh, trials nice. and tribulations of being a flutist yes <laughs> yeah there are many Alex do you want to tell us more about what we have been studying for the last two weeks oh yes so in between sweating and freezing Jen and I have also been playing our flutes <laughs> And the or should I say our piccolos? <laughs> yes, are Woo-hoo. doing alternate instruments this this season. Which actually, the person who wrote the book that we've been doing this the last two weeks would very much disagree with us calling it an alternate instrument. Mm. Uh, we are doing Jean Louis Bois Madier's exercises for the piccolo. Um, and also for all of our French listeners and also anyone else who's listening, sorry for the um, butchering of the French language. I'm studying German. 
Maybe we'll do a German one next time and it'll make it a little easier for me to pronounce. Um, <laughs> but yes, here's a little bit about Mr. Boismardier. He started his studies in Marseille with Joseph Rampal before going on to study with his son, world-famous flutist Jean-Pierre Rampal at the Ooh. Paris Conservatory. Ooh. Uh, he won many competitions before winning the position of piccolo with the Orchestre Nationale de France, where he played for 12 years under batons of Leonard Bernstein, Carl Böhm, Pierre Boulez, and countless other famous composers and conductors. Since then, he has also put together an astounding number of recordings for piccolo and has published his own piccolo score collection mm. by um, Bio, Biodo mm-hmm. Editions. And he also has a YouTube channel and is hosting masterclasses and recording and is just a very active musician and piccolo player. Like He is still going. It is amazing. His website, definitely go check it out. We will put it in the show notes, is a plethora of piccolo knowledge. Oh, look at that alliteration. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. The breakdown of this method. This book, The Exercises, is a series of exercises designed (laughs) exclusively for the piccolo, which are for the immediate flute players. Um, So, and this can kind of be loosely translated. The English translation of the book says uh, anyone who can play the flute correctly, (laughs) this book is okay for them. (laughs) That's Um, a backhanded compliment if ever I heard one. I feel like he'd be a king of this. I know. Oh my gosh, this guy was amazing. Uh, <laughs> but the German, the German translation says intermediate player. Okay. Um, on his website, he has all of his. He has many piccolo books uh, and music listed on a scale of like one to ten for difficulty. And this one comes in at a six, which also makes me wonder what the heck is a ten. We'll get into that later. Uh, so and. Uh, one of the things that he says as well is that the piccolo should be considered as an instrument in its own right, like the violin, and not just a part-time accessory for the modern flautist. Um, which also brings me to, you know, this hot topic of debate in the flute world, flutist versus flautist. Um, for those newbies out there, flutist is just spelled with a U and flautist is spelled with an A-U in the middle. Mm. So, and it's often debated which one is the correct way. Uh, The person who translated this book into English, Samuel Coles, is a British flutist and he wrote it as flautist. Mm -hmm. But then he also trained in the French school. Um, Like in 1987, he won the Premier Prix and the French, write it flutiste, F-L-U-T-I-S-T-E. So Mm. uh, just some food for thought. What's your favorite? I think Jen and I might keep track of who says which one, and maybe at some point we can give you a definitive answer for the rules as to flutist versus (laughs) flautist. Um, But yes, back into our breakdown. This exercise book is separated into 12 different sections. Mm -hmm. The first part talking about um, sonority of the sound. The second part is based on the accuracy of the sound. Then the third part, and I'm I'm grouping the different sections of 12 here into Mm. different groups. And then he has a bunch of exercises in another section to help with these um, issues as well as articulation. And then <laughs> which, uh, the other part, which I'll leave translated before we had our English translations, um, the high-pitched nuances section. And then the end, he works on some different bits for t- tuning with two piccolos, trills, and some extra tips as well. That was kind of a, a rundown of this uh, wonderful exercise book. Mm-hmm. And with that, Jen, how was your week one? Playing the piccolo with Plain Mr. Boismardier. Okay. Well, yes. Okay, so I open the book, <clears throat> look at the table of contents. I was like, okay, I see where this looks pretty well structured. All right. Started with the prologue. The hours and hours of practice mentioned on the first page in the prologue <clears throat> um, had me feeling a little bit apprehensive as I do not have hours <laughs> and hours to practice the piccolo. And my neighbours also probably don't have hours and hours <laughs> for me to practice the piccolo either. So I was a little bit apprehensive at this and I thought, oh, no, is this going to be like a Tafanel and Gobert for Mm -hmm. piccolo? (laughs) Anyway, so there I mustered all my courage and I went to page two. Mm. The sound. It was lovely. I loved this page. He starts you down in the 
low register, which is really unusual for all the other study books I've looked at the piccolo. They all seem to put you in the middle register to start off with to get your embouchure, but he starts from the bottom. He says, I want you to play a low D and make it as round and as soft as possible. And imagine a bass clarinet, which I loved. That was actually a really interesting way to start it because I found it instantly changed my embouchure and the way I thought about it in that I think I was a lot more relaxed and also I think I was making a far more round kind of sound instead of thinking, holy cow, I've just got to make it really small, like get the air up make the embouchure tiny and really tense. It kind of encouraged this idea of relaxation, which I found really, really nice. And then he has this little exercise, this little scale on this this first page, and it's very impressionistic in terms of, it reminds me a lot of like Ravel's scales and Debussy's scales. It's just very beautiful. So he basically just says, I'll just play this scale up and down from like a middle B down to a G as many times as you want, kind of get your embouchure set. Anyway, beautiful. I did my old scales practice trick and I wandered around the apartment and I played this and I felt very friendly towards the piccolo, which is normally not how I feel when I start. So this is this was an encouraging beginning. And then it's just the first week was just kind of exploring the intonation tips. He's got so many. He's yes. literally got There's pages. There's so many. He With goes explanations for each. Oh, e- my gosh. Exactly. <laughs> Although I did discover that my piccolo is quite different to his, clearly, because... Quite a few did not apply the C-sharp. So this is the C-sharp in the middle register or the C-sharp in the upper register or the high, high, high high Upper register, yeah. Yeah. It says to flatten the C and the C-sharp, they will be sharp. My C-flat on my piccolo is horrifically flat. Doesn't matter what I do, it's horrifically flat. I actually have to play alternate fingerings to sharpen it all the time. Ooh. Like I just can't play ordinary C sharp anymore. I got to use these alternate fingerings just because of the way in which my instrument's built, I guess. So a few of these things I was like, oh, different, but good. Pages, pages and pages and pages of these ideas about alternate fingerings for particular notes because intonation, as we know, is the big one in the piccolo. It's the beast of the piccolo. It's the beast oh, yeah. of the piccolo. Really the first week was just me exploring all these alternate fingerings and trying to incorporate them into the exercises which he gave. So he had exercises in regularity of the sound and in intonation. But as you say, he just he just has all these like little beautiful comments. My favourite, I think, was going from the low to the middle register, which is actually quite nasty. I completely agree. Mm-hmm. He says, I repeat, these exercises are designed for students who already have a good technique on the flute, even if I call them beginners on the piccolo. It's like, burn. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, so, yes, being a beginner on the piccolo, I... um, I, can, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know when he would consider you not a beginner on the piccolo. I feel like I'd have to practice hours, Alex, before I could go to the Ooh. next level. So basically my first week was really just exploring all of these intonation exercises and the regularity of the sound and creating a round, warm sound and focusing on the embouchure. That was pretty much my first week, I think. That would sum it up. How did yours look, Alex? My first week, maybe I should explain first that usually Jen and I, we do these uh, books at the same time. Mm-hmm. However, I'm currently undergoing a, uh, <laughs> a project here in Germany, a project mm. or so, um, and mm. I'm very worried about how much time I'm going to have later in the season. So I was actually doing this first week, a week before Jen, mm. and the original copy of the book that we had both found that we were using was all in French, (laughs) Mm. which led to Google Translate being my friend for the first week. So I sat down with like my Google Translate or my (laughs) dbell.com and had the book open as well. Um, So first what I did was I kind of translated bits to figure out which sections were what so I could, you know, practice which sections I thought were the most important Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. like kind of structure my practice for the week. And I have to say, it felt sort of like this book was put together... Mm. Not necessarily like a method, but like Mm. somebody's personally, after years and years of experience, their own personal warm up. Like what we did with Jen, um, uh, sorry, Sharon Sparrow Mm -hmm. back in her six weeks to finals, because it's not necessarily 
the same for each section. So, because normally, you know, it's like, oh, here's a section for toad, here's a section for scales, here's a section for articulation, so on and so forth. And then in each section, it's basically structured the same. But I noticed that for his, it would be very different. So some sections would sometimes include all scale versions, whereas, you know, for the warm-up section, he gives us this one scale. <laughs> yeah. And it's a beautiful scale. It's a beautiful like it's, scale, you know, yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's it. He's like, oh, do some chromatics. Yeah. I do one up to D2 yeah. and then get into this. And then it's just intonation practice. Mm. That was really interesting. At first, I was a little put a back. Like, I was like, what? where's my structure? <laughs> but <laughs> what mm -hmm. I thought of it is like, oh, this is his own personal warm up. And also he says that this is for a pretty good flutist. So maybe he assumes that they also know how to also practice and mm. structure it based on that. Yeah. The more I played through the method, the more I liked it as well. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get so caught up. Because like in some sections, he would include excerpts. Like here's an excerpt that's really good to help practice this, to put into theory. But then in other sections, there would be no excerpt. And in some, there were only <laughs> excerpts and there were no exercises even though it's called an exercises book so but I set my rules up for in week one and I kind of adapted them a little bit because as I mentioned earlier I'm a little time poor mm. for, at the moment mm. so I really only have about maximum an hour for the upcoming weeks to play my flute. Also, since thanks to COVID, I don't have any gigs for the next two weeks, I was also able to take his advice where he's basically like, you know, the piccolo is an instrument in its own right. It is not just an, ad an additional instrument mm. to the flute. Mm. It should be played like this. It should be played like a solo violin. So for two weeks, I decided I would only play piccolo. I would not touch my other flute. Wow. So, Whoa. <laughs> I know. Right? Oh, my gosh. Whoa. Uh, yes. So I decided, okay, this is what he says. This is what I'm going to do. And I, I can do that. I would get through all of his exercises, at least in two weeks. Um, and I chose two excerpts to also kind of polish up as well, which were the Semiomide from Rossini and the Berlioz Serenade, because I've Ooh. never done that. So I noticed that at the beginning of his method, he gives a disc discography as well, which I haven't noticed before in other methods. Mm -hmm. So I made sure that I listened to his CDs every day for a minimum of 30 minutes. So which Very also good. I was hoping would help like, you know, since I don't have as much time, uh, if I had to add an additional 30 minutes of listening to piccolo music every day, maybe that'll help as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where I set it up for my first uh, week. Those were my rules. I was able to follow those. Um, and uh, and I kind of avoided the section you did, the intonation, because I noticed just how much of it was the high register. And already, I think for those of who have listened to us for a while, you know that my neighbors are not a huge fan of me playing all the time. <laughs> and I had noticed, so we have these little shutters, you know, to help keep the heat in. I noticed that whenever I would start to play my piccolo, even though I've, you know, everything closed, I try to make it as soundproof as possible, I would hear one or two shutters go down after about a minute or two of playing. <laughs> <laughs> I was already annoying my neighbors. I could tell even though they weren't saying anything because it happened only at that time of the day. So mm. I kind of, after the first day of trying to work on uh, the third register intonation, I decided that maybe it's not the best idea in the current situation with everybody staying at home and uh, <laughs> kind of avoided that. <laughs> yeah. That was my first week. So I made my little plan, started working through the exercises, and mm -hmm. uh, neighbors are closing the shutters. So, very, uh, <laughs> very good. Yes, but uh, enough about that. Jen, how was your week two? Okay. How did your week two go? Yeah. I kind of ex <laughs> I, I explored further into the book uh, the following week. Um, I started looking at the different exercises for um, articulation and technical finger passages uh, like awkward, awkward coordination passages and high register mm -hmm. pianissimo, which is insanely hard on the piccolo. It's a, <laughs> a whole mm, section on that, mm, yeah. Yeah, kind of just waltzed through it and I picked ones which I felt I was ready for. Some some are like harder than others, so I was kind of working my way up to them. I really liked his articulation exercises, which I started doing. He gets you to do it all without any articulation first to get the sound really round and then all on the syllable two oh, yeah. and then mm -hmm. all on the syllable coo so that you start strengthening um, this is so that you can do double tonguing eventually. Tuka, 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 tuka. So what happens often when you start doing double tonguing is your k sound is weaker than your t sound because we don't use the k muscles as much as we do with the t. So he gave this um, exercise to strengthen your k 
muscles <laughs> in your tongue. Who would have thunk mm-hmm. people? <laughs> Even after a week, mm-hmm. I noticed that um, my double tonguing, especially on the piccolo, was becoming a lot stronger and a lot more even. I also really liked how a lot of his, especially the preliminary uh, double tonguing and articulation exercises, all sit around the middle register. Because I don't know if you find this too, but around about A, G and F and E, sometimes the notes the notes can crack really, really easily, especially with fast articulation. I practiced through those exercises he gave. And yes, it is like all of a sudden after that exercise, then all of a sudden he's got this piece called by Ortez from 1510. I'm like, okay, uh, okay. With no directions about how to practice it. It's just there. Then he has these incredibly detailed ones like articulation in the top register. Right? And then he gives it all out in all of the octaves and you got tuk 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 You know exactly what you have to practice. I loved his double tonguing exercises, particularly the study tuk 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 That was like all the problem notes. And I would put in one exercise. Yeah, in it's, one exercise. But it also sounds like I music, mean, so it's quite fun oh. to practice as well. It doesn't feel like you're just playing an exercise mm-hmm. through and through and through. So I'd always get stuck on line four. That again was my F, G, F, E, F, G, F, E. Death, F-E. death, death, crack, 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 yeah. crack, Oh, crack. gosh. Yep. <clears throat> but luckily, anyway. like, you know, he starts it up a little higher and then he goes yeah. down to it. So it goes as much down as, to like, it. he... So, this is so hard. It's like he, he gives you a little bit of wiggle room, like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can I warm up into you. it. We won't start right on it. Yeah. yeah. I didn't tackle the uh, the very high one in D flat major. I didn't really feel like it. I don't know. I guess I wasn't very structured in how I practiced it. I was kind of just working on things as they kind of piqued my interest. As in, I know with my piccolo playing from before, articulation for me is really hard especially in the middle register to get it good and clean and fast and also um the well intonation of course um Mm. they're my two particular bugbears and at the moment the two pieces I'm working on at the moment in piccolo involve well one is Rossini and of course all the double tonguing on the single note is f sharp Yay! Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you got to, yeah, and then you got to, of course, do the da ya Anyway, so it, um, it's a very nasty piece. So I was like, I'm going to focus on double tonguing. Hooray! And then, really, the rest of the week was kind of mostly focusing on articulation and the intonation, which I've been doing in week one. But then I started exploring all of his, um, uh, technique exercises for finger articulation very funny I like that I know I like finger articulation because usually yeah, who, articulation is just uh with the time <laughs> but today we're all doing it with the fingers so we're yes. doing articulation with the fingers yes <laughs> then again this difficult finger articulation section is incredibly well laid out and very comprehensive and and then all of a sudden oh wait we're back into um high register sled and pianissimo so I, I did, yes. going, going through this, I did kind of get a little bit of whiplash in terms of I wasn't quite sure, I guess they they expect you to know the problems that you have with the flute and to know the exercises which will help you fix it. But to finish off my mm. week too, I did enjoy his few tips at the end. Oh yes, what was your favourite tip? At the end of the book. Uh, my favourite one, which I felt had a definite flaw was a word now for the orchestral piccolo player, he says. (laughs) You will often have long passages without playing, and I recommend that you put the piccolo in a breast pocket. The instrument will keep warm and be better in tune, making it easier to play than if it were cold. I completely agree. My experience with piccolo playing in an orchestra is when it is cold, it is very difficult and out of tune when you start playing it, so you must keep it warm. However, I do not wear a suit jacket. When I'm in a <laughs> concert, because I, I don't know, maybe I, I, I just have never really thought about wearing a tuxedo. I normally wear a dress. Maybe that, um, yes. maybe that's an assumption, but, uh, maybe. yes, I don't have a pocket. Yes. I don't have a pocket is the short, I guess you can wear, you can wear a tuxedo if you want. Um, however, I don't own one, so I don't, and, uh, I don't have a breast pocket in Jen. which to keep. Yes. So I'm like, where is the option for if you choose to wear a dress or a skirt and a top? <gasps> that sounds how was your how, how was your week too, Alex? 
by week two, I had my new book, uh, which had the English translations and the German translations. Mm. So I was doing much mm. better. I was very happy because, you know, <laughs> things that I had written in as high-pitched nuances were actually just high-register slurred. <laughs> and uh, yes. um, after getting the, over the initial shock of how much high-register he has written into this book in week one, like I was overwhelmed. Yeah. It was just all high-register, which of course makes sense. That's the register that needs the most attention. Oh, but it mm-hmm. was very hard. And that, since I was only playing mm. the piccolo every day, I was very glad I had little uh, earplugs. <laughs> and I was <laughs> oh, yeah. very happy with how it was progressing. So, And I also enjoyed, I'm in one of the sections, I'm just turning to it now. He uses little arrows, where, which I haven't really seen printed in a lot of music outside of my professor in Texas's book, um, Dr. Clardy. She uses mm. arrows in her book. Um, to like talk about where you should generally like try and sharpen or flatten the sound be- to keep it like main- mm. to maintain the intonation based on mm-hmm. the um, consistencies of those notes. So I was really excited to see that. I was like, oh, arrows, great, because I draw arrows usually in my own music. Didn't have to do that this time. Yeah. And I tried to deep dive into the uh, technical parts because I kind of breezed over them and had a little minor heart attacks in the first week about those because they are very technically demanding. Outside of they that are. one where he kind of, you know, starts you in an upper register that's a little more comfortable before working down to that middle register funny area. Mm-hmm. For a lot of them, he just dives right in and is like, okay, we're going to... It was like playing Ebert for the piccolo... Wow, <laughs> just like all of the tricky little finger combination. I had also at this point mm-hmm. abandoned the Berlioz serenade excerpt because I was just spending so much time already on like the Samir Sim- uh yeah. excerpt. And that was already proving quite difficult, like using what he says to use for your practice onto that mm. and keep it, you know, consistent. Mm-hmm. But he does like mm-hmm. a, like he's got a nice little section or a blurb about how to play that. And then he also writes in, you know, like where you're supposed to do your kutu kutus or tuku tukus, your double tonguing mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. So I did that usually every day. And did, before I started it, I worked on, he's got a nice little section of staccato practicing on the page adjacent to it. <laughs> so hard. I found it so hard because they are, what are they? They are seven and a half octaves. So you just do like a D and then you do a yeah. C sharp up at the register and then you do it again and you repeat it and then you do yeah. the same thing up yeah. and it's just very uncomfortable for the piccolo and the flute. Yes. So I spent a lot of time on that too, just trying to get it down. Like it's not only like the art, the fingering aspect of it, like making sure that the fingers are under, you know, under lock and key. It's also getting the tongue in there lined up. And yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I had also managed to find a time this week that, that my neighbors were not so... I heard less. I heard only like one shutter go down every time I started to practice. So, but according to the laws in Germany, I'm allowed to spend at least two hours a week, or two hours a day, practicing a personal hobby of mine before they call the police. So, uh, I was definitely staying under that regulation. And in case they ever come yeah. bug me, I'll be like, okay, thanks, but you know, I do respect these times, and I keep the during the quiet hours. I'm trying to be very German. So, uh, anyways, yes. so yeah, so week two was spent just doing that and uh, yeah just getting comfortable with the high register just working through his books and yeah listening to his recordings online so it was really good I'd hoped to also do maybe one of his um, he has a few master classes online too but I didn't get to do any of those intonation in the high register is how I ended my week too it was fun nice <laughs> but yeah on that note I think we're to verdict mm. territory Jen so, I think we are. So, verdict, what did you think? Did the exercises by our French compadre here um, help you? Or did you notice a difference? Are you going to throw this book away now that we are done? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm going to keep this book. This has very useful exercises in it, and I like how it's very, it's far more exercise heavy than any other book I've ever come across for the piccolo. Uh-huh. Um, most, most books I've noticed uh, f- seem to just, purely focus on piccolo excerpts so it's almost like they are thinking of the piccolo as an auxiliary instrument Mm -hmm. but what I liked about what Jean-Louis has done because he sees because he very rightly says the piccolo is its own virtuosic instrument 
I, I really liked how there were so many more exercises which tackle different aspects of piccolo playing and help you kind of get your head around it and all the tips he's got. However, I would say this book, as he, to be fair, he mentions many times, <laughs> he warns us many times that this is for a pretty good flute player to start. <laughs> that could be paraphrasing. And I don't, I don't know if I completely, I, just because of the way the book is structured, for example, it has no structure really, except for sections kind of being grouped together. Yep. I would say advanced players, yes, could use this book themselves because they would know enough to know what to look for and how which exercises to go to solve which problem that they're having. But for, inter, I don't know, the German translation of the intermediate, mm-hmm. I'm not sure, maybe with a teacher who could guide them in the direction of where they need to go or provide or help them create the structure from this book, maybe. Uh, but I think this book is very much geared towards people who have a pretty good independent um, learning system already in place and can kind of research and, yeah, Mm -hmm. don't need a huge amount of structure to point them in the right direction. Yeah, I think this is for a pretty independent player at this point. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's that's my verdict. So it definitely stays on my stand because – but I don't know whether, say, I would recommend it to – yeah, like a high school Someone student, maybe just, just picking yeah. up the piccolo. Or... Although it depends on the high school student, they might be a prodigy. Who knows? No, <laughs> um, but then they wouldn't be. Yeah. No, they would no longer be an intermediate player then. So they would no, be... they would not. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Um, yeah, so that's. I think my verdict is yes, it stays on the stand. However, I would not recommend this to a beginner piccolo player. Uh, or no, well, actually, I wouldn't recommend it to an intermediate flute player. I would recommend it maybe to a university level. Uh, flute player mm-hmm. um, or a teacher to help to give them stuff to teach their students with mm-hmm. piccolo Excellent. that was a very convoluted verdict <laughs> I apologize I love it <laughs> <laughs> what's your verdict about this how do you feel at okay. the end of two weeks yeah so I have to say okay uh first off mm. completely agree with you this is definitely mm-hmm. a method that was developed by an orchestral piccoloist uh who yes like he warned us um although as he, he put it on a scale of like one to ten he put it in six I would probably put it at like a seven or an eight because mm. he, he kind of accepts that you already know all of these scales you already know the basics and the fundamentals of many yeah. difficult aspects of music um yeah but luckily yeah. for us we are professionals um so I found this book so helpful and I have to say mm. My upper register has never been this in tune before. I mean, Ooh. where I can pick up the piccolo. I mean, granted, I was only playing piccolo for two weeks. And base because um, maybe a bit of background knowledge for people who are unfamiliar with flute to piccolo trans- transitions. Many methods mm. um, say like, okay, after you've done about an hour or so of flute, then and your upper register sounds good, switch to your piccolo. Which I would say is mm. also probably good for beginners, just to like help you get the idea of how the sound is, and not just to give up completely when you first start. Yeah, and the air support required. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Um, but yeah. um. For me, just doing it after two weeks, because usually for me, when I do my piccolo playing, which before now was not very often, um, (laughs) only basically when I have auditions and normal maintenance practicing on it. I remember, I think it was day two or three into week two, and I picked it up and I was like, Mm. okay, here we go. Do my little like chromatic, blah, blah, blah. And then I got to doing some baby intonation and stuff, but it was just perfect. Like... I was like, what? Mm. Like, this isn't flat at all. It's not sharp at all. It's basically just right in the zone. And I have to say, it is because of how he structures all of the different exercises. So, yes, I would say, even though it is extremely demanding, definitely approach it if you are, like, you know, a very advanced flute player. And if you're an intermediate and you're wanting to look at this, definitely do it with a teacher or (laughs) listen to our warnings. Um, But, yeah, it is definitely (laughs) staying on my stand. Like, my semiramide is sounding (laughs) fabulous. His notes on articulation really helped. I'm still working through a couple of the things because they are quite challenging. But, um, yeah, Mm -hmm. uh, highly... Highly recommend this. Definitely for the serious piccolo student. Fantastic discography. Go listen to him as well. And mm. it really helped bring his music to life. So really enjoyed it. All in all, this outside of the neighbors probably 
not wanting to talk to me anytime <laughs> soon. This was a very successful two weeks for me. So I'm very happy. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Well, there you go. You heard it here first, folks. Not really. Um, it's been around for a while. There we go. I think that takes, uh, wow, another Odyssey complete. Fantastic. Yeah. On to the next one, I say. Thank you for joining us, listeners. If you want to contact us about your amazing uh, piccolo warmer invention, please do. Uh, you can email us at, at <laughs> you can email us at at the practice odyssey at gmail.com. You can also uh, comment on our YouTube channel, which Alex has amazingly set up. We're also on Instagram. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Well, we are. The, our podcast is not. Listeners, let us know. Should we start a separate Instagram for us? Are there enough of you out there yet? <laughs> There's quite a few. I thought that you posted on yours, don't you? Oh, I do. Yes. If you want updates on new episodes, do check my Instagram, Flute Yogini. <laughs> Flute Yogini. It's also <laughs> Flute, Flute Yogini. It's also a very good Instagram as well, apart from the awesome uh, practice odyssey stuff on it. You can find this podcast in all the usual places. If you can, subscribe. That always helps. Leave us a and review. We appreciate it. <laughs> Leave us a review. It's good. We're we're musicians, so we're fans of, you know, constructive critical feedback. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh dear, what have I done, Alex? What have I done? Constructive critical feedback. Though I do want to say, we are not professional podcasters. We are professional musicians. We so. are. <laughs> Please keep that in mind. Also, also not professional sound editors. The theme music, of course, was written by the fabulous. Alex Woods, and our artwork was by the amazing Ivan Potter-Smith. As always, we'll see you in two weeks, ready for the next Odyssey. (laughs) Have a great fortnight. We'll see you then. Bye. Bye.